I assume that last week you uh, you know me for life in Jesus Christ, and probably the most historic event, of course, in the um, in, within Christianity would be um, the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this is going to be one of the things that makes Christian philosophy particularly distinctive is the way in which it's influenced by a historical event, a revel- revelatory historical event. And the thing that makes history somewhat different from philosophy is that history is often based upon the reports of an event, right? So some of the earliest historians, even the earliest Greek historians, say, for instance, Herodotus or any of these, these were lawyers. Why were they lawyers? Because test, the only way you can tell history is based upon testimony. Preferably, eyewitness testimony. The more reliable your testimony, the more reliable your witness and the better your history. So since Christianity is going to be based in, in large part upon a historical event, the life of Christ, and upon this life as it impacts others, the role of testimony is going to be, or, or giving witness, is going to be particularly important in, in within Christian thought. And this uh, and Paul, the story of Saul's conversion, or Paul's conversion, Saul before he, he's, he's converted, is going to be probably one of the most significant conversions um, in within the history of Christian thought. In part because Paul is going to be probably the single most influential Christian thinker um, excluding Jesus Christ, right? He's going to be viewed as the primary um, interpreter of the gospel, of, of Christianity, um, in large part because the vast majority of the New Testament after the gospels is going to be assigned um, to Paul. So um, in terms of it generally attributed, these are all of the Pauline epistles that are attributed to Paul. Um, these are all, the ones that I have listed as generally attributed are generally agreed to have been written by Paul, but some people are evenly divided as to whether Jesus thought he said it, that specimens were actually written by Paul, and then fewer people um, with all of these options. But of course, Christians across the board are going to, at least some Christians at all times are going to believe that all of these are written by Paul. And therefore, Paul is going to be the, the single most important interpreter of the, of the historical thing, which is the life that What's significant about this is that Paul was not a follower of Jesus Christ when he was um, on earth, and he didn't actually see him in Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry. What's going to be the basis of Paul's authority in large part is going to be his conversion experience. And so we're going to spend um, one, at least one class period delving into, into what's happening here. Uh, so I'm going to give you some historical background in terms of the, I've already talked to you about um, historical events and testimony of Christianity. We'll talk about some of the early conversions, um, Saul's pre-conversion identity, his conversion, and the significance. We'll go into some more of the significance of Paul's conversion. Now, um, many of the Gospels end with Christ giving a charge to the disciples. And Acts 1 will begin also with this charge. And this charge is going to say that they are to bring the gospel to Jerusalem, thus their local area where they're at right now, to Judea, to most of, of the, the, the Jewish population, to Samaria, so the northern Jewish population also, and then to the uttermost parts of the world. And so there, there's already this emphasis in this last charge that the gospel is designed to be opening up the message of Yahweh to globally. It's supposed to start <coughs> with the Jewish people, and then it's supposed to move out to, um, to, to all of the world. And if you get a chance to read the book of Acts, um, you will find um, those are some. This is just some of the epistles that are just written by other people. Um, you will find uh, many conversion tales. Uh, don't pay attention to that just yet. I'll, I'll get to that. One of the most, one of the most significant event, conversions that the 
begins the back is going to be when there were, the disciples are waiting in an upper room just to see what Jesus told them to do. And the Holy Spirit is supposed to descend upon them. And they all start speaking in tongues. But not the kind of tongues where nobody can understand. It's the kind of tongues where people hear their own language spoken. So if you are a native Greek speaker, you hear Greek. If you are a, a native Arabic, Arabic speaker, you hear Arabic. Everyone's kind of surprised. And so there are, and this is one of the major miracles, there are healing miracles that are going to be used as the basis for the presentation of the gospel by Peter and the other um, disciples of Christ. And often the, the presentation of the gospel at this point is going to start with some sort of event that gets, gets people's attention, say for instance a healing, um, the presentation of the life of Christ, and then the situation, especially when speaking to Jewish audiences, and this would make sense, situating Jesus Christ within the Hebrew Bible, because it establishes that Jesus Christ is working within, isn't overcoming a tradition, it's rather fulfilling a tradition. But eventually, this message is going to need to be spread further than just the Jewish population. And of course, when you're dealing with people who are not Jewish, the testimony of the Hebrew scriptures isn't going to carry much weight, because these people aren't Jewish, they aren't worshippers of Yahweh, and so there are going to need to be further kind of testimonies, further evidences that are going to be necessary for perfectly for the first people. Um, one of the first uh, first people who ends up converted in the Book of Acts is going to be uh, is, is going to be Ethiopian eunuch. He's supposed to be a servant, um, I think, of Queen Candace. This is is a picture of of him, and he's he's going to be excluded from. He's, he's clearly interested in Judaism already because he's reading the book of Isaiah when Bill comes and explains the message of Christ to him. Um, but he would have, even if he wanted to enter into the, the, the Hebrew worship, he would not have been fully accepted because of his unit status. That, that would have been, it, been possible. But Philip, when he shares the gospel with him, he shares what the historical events of Christ and then explains how that fits in with the book of Isaiah and the prophecy of the pilots of Isaiah, the Ethiopian eunuch believes it's baptized. So we we begin to have the spreading of the gospel to those outside the Jewry. Um, but it's not until Peter, um, one of uh, Jesus' disciples, because um, you know there are 12 disciples representing the 12 tribes of Israel, and Peter is going to be one of the four disciples goes, receives a vision, and you can kind of see this here, while he's praying, everybody prays on a regular basis, on the rooftop where he sees clean and unclean animals coming down, and he's told to kill me, and he's like, oh, but I'm not going to kill any of these animals, because, because they're not clean, and I'm Jewish, and God says, do not call unclean what I have called clean, and so Peter has to have this special revelation from God through a dream. It says no. Just if you, you can. We are going to. Some, some things are going to be broadened. We're going to be going out and dealing with people who are outside of your comfort zone, outside of of the Jewish world that you've been dealing. With. And then he's told to go to a Roman centurion who has seen a vision and um, heard about Jesus Christ. But he's to tell the story of Jesus Christ to this Roman centurion and. They don't necessarily baptize them at first, but then the centurion and his household receive the Holy Spirit, and Peter says, well, they receive the Holy Spirit. Clearly, they're, he's a Christian too. We, we need to baptize them. So as you see, it's starting to spread out that the disciples, the 12 disciples, their primary ministry is still to the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, but one of, while this spread of the gospel is occurring, um, we begin to already see a certain amount of resistance um, from the Jewish uh, leadership. So uh, we have a, a, an important person, Stephen, who is the first martyr. He is he, he's telling the gospel, and people get so angry with him, and you can read the story as to why, that they stone him. He, he's just there, he's stoned to death. And there's one man in, in the account that's he's watching this stoning. 
enjoying the stoning and being part of the stoning, and that is going to be Saul of Tarsus. And who, as I said before, is Paul's original name. And Saul is a bit like, I don't know if any of you have seen Lane and Draw, he's a little, little bit like Javert, right? Like he's he's gonna enforce the law, and he's gonna enforce the law, and he's gonna go around all of Israel making the law happen and persecuting any Christian, killing any Christian who might violate that law. So this is a man you won't really expect to convert to Christianity. It's, it's not something that, that, that you're going to accept. And he, we know a fair amount about his pre-conversion life. In fact, that's part of what makes Paul such an interesting conversion because it's so unlike him. Now some people might say, well, of course a poor person would convert to Christianity. His life is better. Of course a person who's kind of excluded on the fringes would convert to Christianity because it, it does something to him. He can gain something. Paul has everything to lose by becoming a Christian. He is he was born in Tarsus, uh, which is approximately in modern-day Turkey, Turkey, where there's a major school of philosophy and literature. This man is... From, from, a, from all accounts in terms of both his history and what his reading, schooled in probably Hellenistic philosophy, Hellenistic literature. This is the man who has the best of what the Roman Empire Greek um, Greek culture has to offer. Um, and he's also an Israelite. And he's not just an Israelite. He's an Israelite of Israelites. He's of the tribe of Benjamin, you know, one of the, a, a very one of uh, Joseph's sons. He has two Hebrew parents. You know, when when the Hebrew people are exiled, many people have only one Hebrew parent. This is, he's someone whose credentials as an Israelite are undisputable. He is a Hebrew of Hebrews. On top of that, his father's a Pharisee. And he's and he is a Pharisee. So he has not just um, just he, he has perfect law credentials, right? He, the Pharisees are a sect in Judaism that were very, were probably one of the more learned sects within Judaism. They, if you read the Gospels, you can find out some more about them, but for now, um, it's, it's mainly important that he's trained in, in a rabbinic um, tradition that acknowledges that uh, resurrection is possible. This is important because there's another um, Jewish tradition at the time, the Sadducees, who are going to say that the resurrection of the dead is not a true hope of the Israelites. But he's, so he's a Pharisee, so he's not just, he's kind of in the upper echelons of the Jewish nobility. On top of that, he's born a Roman citizen. So he's got the best of both worlds. He's taught in Jerusalem by, by Gamaliel, who's probably one of the most distinguished Pharisee rabbis. He's known as a star pupil. And he, um, he's also a tent maker, pretty lucrative kind of profession. So this is a man who has money, has prestige, has power, not just in one world, but in the two major worlds in which he's living in, the Jewish world and the Roman world. Why on earth would he want to convert to Christianity and really jeopardize all of this? Um, and yet, uh, in his conversion, he does just that. He's supposed to be on the exit. This conversion, and I've heard one of the reasons I have this PowerPoint, is it's it's a favorite of artists throughout history, Christian artists throughout history. This depiction of Paul suddenly being on the road to Damascus. And whether his horse falls or, or what happens, he's blinded. He can't see. Um, and he's he either sees Christ in a vision or just hears the voice, and that voice says to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the pricks or against the goats. You're sitting there, you're kicking, you're trying your hardest to stay in a specific place, even though it's painful for you. Because it seems to suggest that Paul knew what he was doing was wrong. But Paul, Saul, on this road to Damascus, on this road to um, to persecute more Christians, is now blind, has received a vision, and has been told that in 
order to, that he needs to seek out Ananias in Damascus for further instruction. And God comes to Ananias and tells Saul, Saul so it, it tells him that Saul is coming to him. And Ananias doesn't want to have anything to do with Saul because Saul is a known persecutor of Christians. Who wants to go talk to the person who's about to kill you? Nobody. But he receives this vision and is told you need to do this. And so he received, Ananias preaches the gospel to him. Paul heals Paul. And then the interesting thing is, from a authoritative from a, a perspective, and he's that Paul is baptized. That Paul does and it has his name changed to Paul. Paul doesn't go immediately to talk to the apostles, the other major authorities within this new religion, Christianity. Um, instead, he goes off to Arabia and is on a mount. It sounds an awful lot like he's going to Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is supposed to have been in Arabia. And there he's supposed to, for three years, have had visions and talk with God. And then he goes back to the apostles, and then he goes back. Um, to the Jewish world. So he has a certain foundation of authority that is not rooted in just receiving things directly from the other, other apostles. And this is going to be significant because he's going to view his mission as being the apostle to the Gentiles. He's going to be the one who is the messenger, the key authority that brings the gospel of Jesus Christ out of the um, of Judaism. And if you decide this is another um, depiction of this, or the depiction of this, um, and if you uh, decide you want to read the book of Acts, you will see the vast majority of it is going to consist of looking at Paul's missionary journeys. Because Paul is going throughout the world, uh, throughout the, his, his world, and he's starting, he's going to start off. <coughs> Um, kind of making smaller journeys and then larger journeys and then he's going to make it all the way to Rome. And he's going to go into a town and he's going to initially preach in the synagogue because that's um, the way you start with the Jewish people and then he's going to start preaching to those who are not Jewish in any of these given towns. And it's his goal, and if we, we read this in the epistles, to, to preach the gospel where it hasn't been reached before. So we have, and many of the letters that we have from Paul are written to people who Paul is supposed to have, um, have since, uh, have, have kind of given birth to and faith. The one exception is going to be Romans, where he doesn't make it, Christianity makes it to Rome before Paul does. But Paul writes the book of Romans as, as kind of a substitute for his personal presence. Until and we will read from Rome in this class. So, so that gives you a sense of of Paul's um, of, of Paul's significance in history. He, he, this is a man who should not have, by any account, wanted to become a Christian. He had the best of the Jewish world, he had the best of the Roman world. He, he was learned, and yet. This is he is, he is personally responsible after his conversion for the spread of the gospel throughout most of the Roman Empire and for the interpretation of the Bible as we have it in many of the epistles that are found in the New Testament. So here's a man who's significant for his conversion, it's significant for his influence, and then finally he's significant as a type of conversion. Because conversion is probably a very, it is a very key concept within the Christian tradition. Conversion in the Hebrew tradition often, often was thought of in terms of return from exile. You are you're, you received the law, you turned away from the law, you're going back to the law. Um, conversion, with in terms of Paul, is going to be understood in terms of your lived a sinful life, a major experience that may, may help you see the error of your ways, and you may you turn around and you go in opposite position. And and so even this will even show up in St. Francis' Amazing Grace, 
I once was blind, but now I see. This kind of blindness for Paul is physical, represents also spiritual blindness, the inability to see spiritually what needs to be seen. And thus the, the recovery of sight is used as a metaphor for conversion. So, um, so Paul is, is really going to, he's going to have influence both in terms of his authority and in terms of his testimony, but also in terms of uh, how he represents what kind of, uh, what, what is a common experience of the Christian life which is going to be the experience of conversion. Are there any questions? Was he really um, hated by the, like the other Jewish people that didn't like, that thought Jesus was kind of like ruining their religion or something? Um, I, I'm, I'm hearing was he hated by other Jewish people? Yeah, I mean, because I mean, it seems like, I mean, if he was he was Jewish, right? Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, if he's like out talking about how great Jesus is, it seems like a lot of Jews would probably really hate him for that. That's a really good question. But really in Christianity, um, there's this kind of, is this a new religion? There's a question, is this a new religion? Or is this um, just Judaism fulfilled? Christians are going to want to say, especially Jewish Christians are going to say, this is Judaism fulfilled. So Paul and Peter and many of these other um, of these other converted Jews are going to continue to worship in the temple. And we'll talk, and Professor Bonifat uh, tomorrow will talk to you about the ways in which um, there that's kind of two rules set up for those who were Jewish and converted and those who were Gentile and converted. But there's definitely a, a hatred of Paul and of anyone who would who would seemingly be overcoming this Anyone who would be doing the Pharisees don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. The fact that Paul is believes Jesus is the Messiah is going to be a key question. If you the the it's interesting, Paul actually we have two accounts of Paul's conversion in the book of Acts, and the second account comes when a bunch of Jewish um, leaders decide that they want to persecute Paul by bringing him before the Roman authorities. And what Paul does is he, he tells the story of his conversion, but then he says, I'm called on a point of rabbinic, um, it's just a, it's a, it's a matter of interpretation. I have the parasitical belief in the resurrection of the dead. So this is, a, this is actually, so, so sometimes he would actually take, he would, he would say, oh, I'm just working within this Jewish tradition, and I'm <coughs> hope it, and so of course the Sadducees aren't going to believe it. So he, he's going to be both working within the Jewish tradition as an answer and receiving um, opposition from it. Uh, because there are definitely rabbis and leaders who are going to try to persecute him. Next question. Um, when you say that some people believe those Christianity was um, Jewish religion fulfilled, was that that they believe Jesus was the Jewish Messiah and that he had brought kind of, I don't know, the religion to? What it was supposed to do. I don't know. Yes, yes, that, that's exactly it. In fact, um, since we have some time, I'll, um, uh, I will read to you a little bit from um, from Acts, where where Peter is going to say, if you have a Bible with you, you can look along with me. We're going to look at Acts 2. And, and Paul. Peter's going to say, "Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell, all you that dwell in Jerusalem, let it be known to you and hearken to my words that these men are not drunken." Because when the, they started speaking in tongues, some people were like, "Oh, he might be drunken." But this is, but this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, said God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. So he views his event as fulfilling the Christ. And then he, he said, um, okay. he, if you go down to verse 25, 
he talks about the life of Christ and he says, David spoke concerning Christ, saying, I foresaw the Lord always before my right hand, before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be removed. Um, okay. I, I promise you, I'm not finding what I'm looking for here. But they will, he will, uh, he will definitely cite prophets. He, they will cite, um, they will consider him to be fulfilling the law. Um, there's some controversy over whether he was considered an apostle. Um, how do you feel about that? That's a good question. I, my, my general sense is, at, so at the beginning of, <coughs> of the book of, of Acts, you have a, um, you have them cast, the apostles casting lots for who's going to take Judas's place. And they cast lots, and they pick a man who we never hear from ever again. Um, and so, and so the question is, oh, is Paul, that 12th, actually the real 12th apostle, or is Paul um, something else? My general feel, based upon how numbers work, because numbers are actually very significant within the Jewish tradition, is that 12 is the perfect, is the number of Israel. But then Paul claims to be the apostle to the Gentiles, and so Paul is that apostle outside of the 12 that's his primary and main focus is going to be upon the Gentile world. Yeah. Um, when you see the scriptures and the basically he Jesus Christ is going to be the fulfillment the new lawgiver 
focusing everything on love. Um, I'm just trying to uh, okay. Perhaps Matthew answered this question best. So if you if, if one wants to really see how um, how Christ is in the sex of us or how Christ is built in the property, a lot of the issues are dealt with in the gospel of Matthew. He starts out with a genealogy explaining Mary's uh, virginity and how it may seem weird to Jewish audiences, but then also how other supposedly disreputable women have been heroic in certain circumstances. So he actually he's speaking to a he's speaking to a Jewish audience there. And um, on the Sermon of the Mount, it's fairly clear that he says well, the law has said this, but I say to you, and he expands it. He doesn't necessarily abrogate it. Uh, these, these, these critical commandments, and he has that. I have come not to fulfill, but I have come not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. I think a lot of those questions can be answered in, in Matthew, and there's this big divide in, uh, at this time between the messianic, uh, or between suffering Messiah and the liberty Messiah. And the way Christians usually work through that is that generally with the heroic, or the suffering servant, um, that's the first time. They sacrifice um, sheep for the sheep for the shearer. And then they leave the heroic Messiah and the redemption of Israel uh, in its literal sense to a second time. Who is the way the so you see Matthew um, that Christians are really coming heads with certain other, uh, certain other Messiah. Gamaliel in Acts does a very good job of, of differentiating when he says, look, we have other messianic movements here that have all died off. You know, and he cites two examples. And he says, if this movement is not true, it'll go away. Just like all the other messianic movements. But, if this movement is, is for real, then we're fighting against God. Which means that uh, uh, we're going to go. So you have in Acts, Gamaliel, who, uh, who is trying to better who is trying to justify how even the Jewish uh, the Jewish scholars who are Christians should treat should treat the Christians. And he takes an approach where basically says, we don't know if it's inside or outside Judaism, we're going to wait, we're going to make God inside that. So I think Matthew uh, and uh, two different versions of the sign and Acts are pretty good to clarify that. As, as his example, as his comment has point, pointed out, really, that this is a very complicated issue um, and one that we will continue to examine throughout the course of the semester, in large part because one of the biggest questions in early Christianity was this relationship of the Old Testament to the New Testament. And for example, certain uh, people will come to believe that, um, and they're going to be known as Marcionites, that actually the Old Testament God was a angry, vindictive, unjust God, and the New Testament God is a God of love and mercy. But as it, but we will look at ways in which Christians, including Paul, have articulated that this is in fact the same God, only a further revelation of him in the incarnation. But the main thing that I want you to get away from, I mean, get, get from today's class, and it's a very simple point, but it's a very important point, especially within the context of philosophy, is the role of testimony here. Because story is often not we are also often not sure where to put story within, within the framework of philosophy. Where we often, sometimes, especially continental philosophy is more comfortable with narrative and with story, but within the Christian tradition, event and um, and it's the telling of the events is going to be crucial for revelation and for understanding. It's going because testimony is how history operates. I mean, just, just as an example, Plato is going to say, you can make arguments about things like mathematics, but when you deal with things that have to do with this world, 
you can only make probable accounts and one might infer based upon testimony or witness or story. You can only give stories for things that happen to do with history. And so if you have a God who works in time, and it goes back to our concept of what it means for God to be God, if you have a God that works in time, the role of story is going to become much more important than if you have a God who exists up there somewhere, maybe causes the world, and lets it go. This is a God that works in time, and therefore this is a God who, for whom story is actually a legitimate way of understanding things. And this personal story, particularly the personal story of someone like Paul, who is going to eyewitnesses, I mean, just think about it for a minute. If you are a lawyer, and you're going to try to understand what um, what it means, that you're going to try to fit way testimonies, because basically all you have is a bunch of eyewitnesses. I don't know if any of you have seen, it's an old film, but an old Jewish film called Rashomon. What of it happens, the whole film is about different people having different perspectives that seem completely at odds with one another about the same one event. One of the things that lawyers do and have to do in order to distinguish between um, good evidence and bad evidence is to determine the reliability of a, test, a testifier. Go ahead. Can testimony even be described as evidence? Testimony is a form of evidence. It it's one of the only forms of evidence that you can have for historical events. So for instance, science, when you're examining nature, which theoretically doesn't change, you can conduct scientific experiments. You can't conduct scientific experiments when you're dealing with history because it happened in the past. You might collect evidence that might be physical, but ideally you want to have eyewitnesses and you want to have reliable eyewitnesses. And the more likely, and, the, and if, a, if an eyewitness has everything to lose by saying, because basically Paul is going to die impoverished, in prison, and he's going to live a very difficult life after his conversion, that is going to, many are going to see this as a test, as reliable evidence for the truth of his claims because he basically gave up <coughs> for something he had. He suffered for something that he shouldn't have, he wouldn't have done. He would not have chosen suffering freely. He would assume someone doesn't choose suffering freely <coughs> unless they think, no, this is true. This is something that happened. I think that's all question. Yeah. Um, this may be like uh, too long of a discussion for today. I was wondering on the Gospels, um, how did they get together to choose which were going to be adequate and true and which books to include in the New Testament? That is a really good question. Um, and that is really, I, I mean, of course, a big question. But in general, one of the things that's going to, um, in the early early period, you're going to look for apostolic authority. Maybe not apostolic authorship, but is there going to be Someone who has an, has an eyewitness relationship. Remember, this is a this is a world that is not based upon written about writing in the way that our world is, right? This is a world that has writing, but a lot of things are done based upon um, you have to you know have to know whether you can trust the person who's giving the account. And so, an apostle <coughs> is going to be thought of as an authority of what of what Christ is saying because he's going to be an eyewitness, but not just an eyewitness, an eyewitness that's authorized by Christ when he says, these are my disciples. Not These aren't just my disciples, my followers. These are the ones that I authorize to represent me to the world. And so this is why Paul is going to have, thank you for that question, Paul is going to have to have, um, is supposed to have a direct encounter with Christ in order to be legitimately considered an apostle, because that's going to give him authority. So very basically, certain ideas, certain of the different uh, statements of the Gospels. Um, Matthew is thought to have been an apostle. Luke is supposed to have gotten a lot of his information, at least traditionally, from uh, Mary and I think Peter. So, so that John is supposed to have been, a, have been an apostle. The reason why these have been, a lot of the major epistles are supposed to have been thought as authoritative or because Paul, they have the authority of Paul behind them. Um, and and so, if you, uh, there are some books, and if you come to me, I can tell you about them, that talk about some of the earliest uh, physical data, data that we have. 
manuscript data in terms of the various lists that people have. But as a general rule, the ones here, authorship or authorizing, I know, notice I'm using it, authorship is a very narrow term for us. Authority is a, is a much more important word for them. Uh, it's going to, a lot of the lists that they have, oftentimes the parts where people would be not so sure is when the book of Hebrews, for example, doesn't claim to have an author. Some people think it might have calling authorship. So people are gonna be like, oh, is this, should this be in the canon, should this not be in the canon? So in large part, what's gonna happen with the canon is, is you're going to have people over time who have these lists that they think are, in general, authorized, but, but that's going to be confirmed by can councils later. So you're, we have, before councils, we have a lot of lists that have an, about an 80, 85% core agreement. And then within councils, which are basically meetings of church leaders, the kind of a definitive statement is going to be made concerning this is going to be the end. We have, we also have a similar thing happening in Judaism when a council drops up. A good question. Um, any other questions? This turned out to be a good discussion. But, but yes, so the other key, key idea I want to get into your mind right now is conversion. Because the move from one state of being to another state of being, to, to the move from, it is going to be, have implications for what human nature needs. Human nature needs a change, a, a turning away from the old towards the new. So, so the fact that Paul's conversion becomes a type of many conversions in nature is, is an important concept to grasp at this stage. Okay, good. All this guys.